Okay, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me this morning. Uh, I feel privileged to be able to, to speak about this topic. Um, I sort of uh, recognise that, you know, with, with my title, I'm going to be definitely uh, preaching to the converted, but hopefully I can, you know, give you a few insights as to our journey, and particularly from that government perspective, which has uh, many challenges and hurdles to, to overcome, uh, basically in the world of, you know, trying to, you know, use open source software and, and bring that into the enterprise. So, um, first I think I'd just like, you know, for the people that are obviously from Australia and, and maybe not so informed about uh, land information New Zealand, just give you a little bit of context, I guess, about sort of the type of people that we have in the organisation and sort of the, I guess, some of the, the big drivers that, that, that um, you know, push us to use um, our technology solutions. So, um, one of the, I guess, the key things, which is probably quite a differentiator with a lot of central government agencies, is that we've got... Uh, quite a large technical engineering kind of workforce uh, within Lynn. So, you know, we're doing things such as um, geodesy, positioning, geophysics, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, producing lots of technical products, you know, relating to, you know, charts and maps and those types of things. And so, you know, we've got people in there that are doing things like research, um, you know, really trying to solve, you know, custom bespoke like technology problems. And so that type of environment, um, you know, really sort of fosters our requirements for our technologies and, and our solutions that we seek for. Uh, a really um, key thing uh, which is quite fundamental and goes throughout all of Lynn's kind of like objectives and drivers is actually producing open data for benefit for all of New Zealand. So <coughs> that in itself um, is a really interesting uh, facet because it's got a lot of open and transparency kind of elements to it but also it's about interacting with a large wide community of uh, people that actually have lots of different requirements. So um, for people that probably don't know some of the specific things that, that go, go on at Linz, uh, I'll just give you, um, I guess, a, a little bit of a teaser of sort of like the main ones, particularly the ones which are contributing to our um, use of our technology and driving us to use open source. So, um, one of probably the, the fundamental things that, that we do at Linz is that we provide the positioning and the geospatial referencing framework. So we um, provide the coordinate systems and the datums and the transformations that drive a lot of the geospatial stuff that happens here locally in New Zealand. So that's quite a key important point because a lot of geospatial activities that occur beyond um, you know, the, the realm of geodesy are, are, are basically falling off this. Um, you know, we do things like uh, deformation modelling, which is, you know, obviously trying to uh, deal with uh, New Zealand's changing size and shape and all of our geohazards. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a particularly large piece of work that we do. Um, beyond that, we've got a lot of uh, products and services that are of a geospatial nature. So we're producing uh, things such as hydrographic charts, topographic maps, and uh, basically a whole lot of other key, like, fundamental or... Um, you know, sort of foundational geospatial layers that um, either go into our products and services or um, basically are going out as open data, as I mentioned before. Um, probably the, the last, like, really key thing to, to mention is that um, we manage the survey and title uh, land registry, and that's obviously um, a pretty uh, fundamentally important piece of technology for the operating of our economy. So I'd just like to sort of step back a little bit and go, well, how did this open source kind of journey start at Linz? And um, it predates me. Um, so Linz was formed on the back of another government agency, which was Department of Lands and Survey. Uh, and, you know, basically there were some people in, in that department before Linz was formed in 1996 that... Um, already had sort of this um, drive to, you know, want to create solutions using open source. So there's another member of the community who's actually here, I think, in another session, Chris Crook, who was probably one of the sort of the drivers of open source initially in the early days in Lynn. So our geodetic mark information system, uh, which is used quite widely by the survey cadastral community, was all built on open source. And even back in those days, um, really open source was probably the only solution to deliver web services and to um, provide a website uh, with access to our geodetic information. And so Chris was, was really fundamental in getting that going and it was even so far back, you know, that we were hosting on the government uh, computing system and um, we were really trailblazing with things like Perl and even before like Apache and, um, 
you know, things such as uh, MySQL came available, we were looking for options to, to make that happen. But eventually around about sort of like 1996, 1997, uh, we kind of landed on uh, using an open source stack. And that was really the first, I guess, like key kind of like uh, product services and offerings that we were using open source with. I think um, probably the, um, the the period that ensued after then was um, really about Lynn's making a transformation to uh, do automation around its survey and title land tra transaction processing system. And that whole project was a massive uh, initiative. $160 million was, was pumped into it. Um, we brought in all the vendors and the suppliers all around the world, and we, we basically ended up with quite a world-leading system. Uh, and, and underlying that system uh, that we developed, you know, which probably took roughly around about kind of four years or so, um, we implemented a database system using Infomix uh, database technology and uh, ESRI software development. And so that um, actually caused quite a few massive changes across the Lens environment at that point. Um, we started talking about enterprise architecture. We started talking about trying to rationalize the way that we were basically building systems in Lens and trying to reuse those components. And so all that stuff was really kind of starting to, to come in and become sort of like the big um, enterprise IT within the organization. And, and sort of, um, you know, this was sort of in the period around about kind of 2002, 2003. It was about this point that I turned up at Lens and I was a fresh graduate. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story about, I guess from my perspective, you know, how we sort of really started to get into the geospatial um, open source world from this kind of context and environment. So I came into um, basically the um, property rights uh, survey generals team and I was like tasked with having a look at our cadaster and trying to uh, basically do some data quality analysis across our cadaster to try and improve it. Um, we had some bugs within our land and line application and we were producing uh, basically incorrect parcels or duplicate nodes or topology issues. So, um, you know, got in there and tried to basically um, figure out what was going on. At that point in my career, I was pretty fresh eyed. I had no idea what open source was. I had very little idea about the wider breadth of geospatial technologies. I was just really passionate and keen to get in there and try and uh, basically uh, get some solutions done. So I upskilled myself in ge geospatial technology stacks. I learned SQL. I learned all about geospatial operators. Um, I learned about Infomix. I went on Infomix DB courses. I learned about ESRI and the SDKs. And so I, I rapidly learned this stuff probably in a period of sort of like three to six months. When I came in to try and solve this business problem around topologies, I got into the current technology stack that we had, um, tried to start running some SQL queries in Infomix to produce the results and hit some massive roadblocks. I was getting uh, index memory corruptions. I was getting core dumps on the Infomix backend. Um, I was not having success in being able to transfer large data sets into the Esri environment. And so at this point, um, my first call to was to go to the IT team. And the IT team had a vendor that was um, basically supporting the products, uh, which was uh, basically PwC slash IBM at that point. And then they obviously had relationships with the Infomix and the Esri people. Um, when I tried to get response from that, it took multiple months to get a response back, we're not gonna fix that. So at that point, I started getting frustrated and I'm like, okay, so how am I gonna solve this problem? So I get into Google and I just start searching what are the other options and the other tools. And it was at that point I ran into open source and I ran into communities and I ran into lots of different avenues, which was probably where the journey kind of like started for me. And so on my Google search, <laughs> I pretty quickly um, found that there was MySQL, had a bit of play with that, it didn't have any spatial capabilities, and found Postgres and PostGIS. And so, at probably within about a week, I had ditched trying to spend any more time on Infomix and Esri, and was starting to get community support from, uh, you know, people such as Paul Ramsey and uh, Dave Blasby, who were some of the key people setting up uh, the PostGIS project to help me load this like Lynn's data into uh, PostGIS and start doing some queries. Funnily enough, 
when I tried to do some of my, um, I guess what I was classing as big data queries back then with you know multi-million rows, it's not big anymore, but um, I also actually got some index corruption with the data that I was putting it in. But the funny thing was that I went immediately to the community and the mail list and asked for support. And lo and behold, the next day, Dave had come back and said, oh, I've got a, I've got a um, resolution, here's a patch, go away and basically um, recompile your software. And we didn't really look back from there. <laughs> from there, you know, PostGIS was really the gateway, I guess, probably into a lot of geospatial systems that we have in LUNS now. So, um, you know, we have uh, lots of uh, parcel topology uh, networking checks running off PostGIS. Um, you know, we now have, have basically branched into using PostGIS as a core backend for a lot of our data management systems, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, later. Um, so, probably what's ensued over the last kind of, uh, I guess, 10 or 15 years, gosh, it's uh, time has flown, is that um, We've, we've really started upskilling ourselves within our own organization. Uh, we've got now a lot of really passionate people around open source, really highly uh, capable people that have all started uh, learning about open source technologies and actually implementing and developing those. We're, we're by means, no means, you know, sort of like complete in terms of that capability, but we're on a quite a rapid uh, journey of, I guess, increasing our capability and maturity to you know, to basically enable ourselves to deliver our products and services for, for our customers. And some of the key products that are really underpinning what we do within our organization are pretty much the kind of like the standard fundamental ones that you all hear about. Um, you know, we really do rely on these packages um, quite a lot. Um, in particular, you know, GDAO and Proj and QGIS um, and Ubuntu and Postgres and PostGIS are probably quite prevalent across um, I'd say at least 50% of our solutions now within LINS. Um, I'd just probably also like to say at this moment, like currently when within LINS, we are both a, an open source and I guess a proprietary shop. We've got lots of solutions within LINS delivering to all of our products and services. Um, but more and more as we're developing new systems and we figure out that we need to develop bespoke solutions, you know, to obviously meet our you know, our customers' needs or even our regulatory needs, we're looking towards open source and going in-house to actually deliver that stuff, which is quite a shift from where we were um, probably 10 years prior to that. Um, you know, I've put up a big long list of things that we've been doing. I don't expect you to read through it, but it could be a bit of a record and you can have a bit, a bit of a look through later. Um, but really, I guess the key thing in, in just in seeing that long list is that you can see that um, that Linz has really made some, some big shifts in jumping into the community, supporting and funding quite a lot of um, you know, key pieces of work that actually um, help uh, the whole wider geospatial community. In particular, some recent ones that we've been uh, putting direct funding into is helping out the, um, the GDAL barn raising activity, which is about fundamentally improving the coordinate system and the WKT support across PROJ and GDAL and then all the, um, the downstream products that use that. Um, you know, we, we're always actively uh, basically funding and promoting uh, fixes within the PostGIS community and uh, also um, quite a lot within the QGIS community. Um, even on our staff, we've got like um, basically open source community committers. So uh, some people may be aware of a guy, Sandro Santilli, who is um, a core PostGIS um, Committer, so we actually have him on staff, and he does work for us, um, delivering to uh, specific projects that we do. But we also leverage his knowledge to then basically uh, push stuff back to both the PostGIS and the QGIS environment. So I guess probably um, I guess the 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 thing that's probably really critical, and we've started really um, summarising some of this internally to clarify some of our strategic thinking going forward for new products. And um, I guess some of the, the drivers around this uh, particularly have been our latest rethink around uh, redeveloping our land online system. Some people may be aware that we've got a program underway called um, STEP, um, which is about enhancing our current land online system. And within that, that system, um, we basically made some very, very big shifts from where we were when we developed it uh, kind of like 15 or 20 years ago. Um, some of the, the big kind of drivers for change that we were uh, talking about were 
that we were looking um, you know, to try and pro basically provide a solution that was um, going to be really um, fit for purpose for our, our customer base, um, was going to um, basically um, allow us to have basically good control and maintenance of that product going forward and uh, was to never basically try and uh, well, to, to not to produce a solution that would require us to um, have to go back and completely re-architect re and spend hundreds of millions of dollars on it um, um, in you know, sort of 10 years time. So when we were kind of like looking through that process, um, you know, we were looking at some of like the key kind of strategies and processes that we, we could employ. Um, including uh, having a look at, um, you know, should we be doing this in-house? Should we be outsourcing? Um, what should the technology stack be? Um, how would we be uh, basically leveraging uh, communities or vendors to actually deliver that capability for us? And so a lot of the thinking that went into that original uh, business case um, was um, that we should actually move the development in-house, that we should be leveraging open source. Um, and that we should be, um, you know, basically leveraging uh, community work to help try and produce that solution. And so, um, you know, really that's, that's what's um, kind of like driven, I guess, a lot of this um, further clarity and thinking of this journey that we've been on. So, like, the, I guess probably to summarise and go through the key points, really what we came up with at that time is that, you know, probably, and just as my sort of original kind of like story told you, is that, one of the key reasons why Linz actually goes with open source is it's really empowering for the individual um, and it really creates innovation and passion for people to be able to deliver high quality solutions that, that meet customers' requirements. Um, but, you know, that personal ownership, working with the community, um, you know, having, you know, um, basically, you know, direct influence to try and help solve problems that meet customers' needs and um, you know, leveraging open source to do that is, is a really, really key factor for us. Um, so that's probably number one. Um, probably the other thing which has been a uh, yeah, movement across uh, New Zealand government and also many other governments is basically uh, becoming a, a digital-centric agency you know, to try and deliver better uh, public services for, for you know, citizens. And a lot of the strategies that have been put in place um, you know, and, and analyze to, to try and drive that are talking about being open, about being transparent, about working with your customers and about working with the wider community to make that happen. And all of those kind of like principles that are in there really are really tailored to working with open source solutions. And so that's, um, that's also a key driver. Um, Probably don't need to speak about the community, that's all you people plus the wider global community. That's a huge amount of um, basically expertise and uh, capability that, that, you know, as a government organisation we tap into and we leverage and we feed off and has helped us solve endless problems that would have just been, you know, technology blockers for us internally or with other um, vendors that um, wouldn't have addressed things. So, you know, that's a really, really massive point. Probably something which is, um, you know, quite close to, to my heart and also quite fundamental in the way that governments works is ensuring that when we actually provide our products and services and provide our front shop for our customers, that we need to make sure that we're doing that in an agnostic way and we're using open standards and we're doing that in an interoperable way. So if we were um, using a lot of uh, proprietary solutions, um, they basically push you down a pathway of using their proprietary interfaces and not supporting those types of, um, of open standards. And so for us, using open source is a key enabler to kind of make those standards come to life. Uh, the last one is, is control, and I kind of like touched on that with our Land Online uh, Enhancement Program. But having control is really, really important, um, both in terms of taxpayers' uh, funding, but also in terms of making sure that the customer needs are more rapidly able to be turned around. So in terms of like funding, um, you know, if we don't go in-house and we have to basically go and buy a vendor's product, procurement comes into, um, basically into case. And procurement is a very, very expensive process that can even cost you like tens of millions of dollars. And it's not just on your side, it's also on the vendor's side as well. And um, so, you know, that is something that, you know, most definitely going down an open source path, um, 
doing things in-house, using things through smaller contracts, working collaboratively with communities that you can avoid a lot of that stuff. So that was, that was quite a key thing as well. Um, also with, you know, kind of a lot of our bespoke government systems, you know, these are enduring things that are regulated that, um, you know, need to keep being provided to New Zealand citizens for many, many years. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we have control of that and not our vendor. So, you know, that's probably the other key point. So, any questions? Um, just based on the last talk we saw with uh, Niall, Nathan and Emma, uh, what kind of pushback did you get uh, within the organisation when you decided to go down the open source path? Yeah, it's a really, really good challenge, that one. Um, so much was, was talked about as the myth of support. So particularly within our IT department at the time and our enterprise architect, the feeling was with you know, some of the technologies and components that we were looking at that they didn't have what was so-called class commercial support. Um, so that had to be debunked within the department and you know, pretty much um, I led some of those conversations, including that there are people that provide commercial support for open source packages and that actually the community support mail lists are um, great knowledge bases and great resources to actually get stuff resolved. Even if you don't have SLAs and contracts around them, they are probably even more effective in many cases than using commercial support desks. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, my question is in regards, since Linz works a lot with um, governments and how you use open source. We have, I think Edwin touched a little bit this on, about this in his keynote speech. So we're from Samoa and a lot of the data that we work with from government, they hold on to the data um, quite a lot. So when it comes to sharing data with public people and we're possibly hoping to build some of something similar to the interface that Linz has in sharing public data to make it publicly available for the people. Um, how, like, uh, when you came across this issue with some of your, uh, the government agencies in regards to sharing their data on Linz, how did you go about um, different government agencies that did not want to share certain things because we have this issue in Samoa yeah. and stuff and we hope to kind of make this data available because we only are able to share it like what um, Edwin was talking about, unless you know the technical people holding on to and handling the data itself, it's kind of difficult to get it to for certain projects and yeah. Yeah, so the, I mean, that's more of a, an open data question, but yeah, more, more than happy to answer that. Um, that probably to say within the New Zealand government, there are still challenges in getting access um, to the data itself. I mean, first of all, I'd say within Lynn's, our strategy is that the data is the gem and that is the most important thing. We need to have control and ownership over that. So that's a bottom line in any um, you know, pathway we take either in-house or commercially. So it's that type of policy that first you have to embed within your agency. Um, beyond that, I mean, there are many other drivers across um, you know, government agencies as to whether or not that data um, you know, can fall in line with that, that strategy of being basically owned by government and easily, um, you know, accessible and open. Um, you know, within the government environment within New Zealand, you know, central government agencies um, basically have, you know, principles and policies that say that the data that is collected and paid for by the taxpayer must be um, openly available and, and, and provided. But then when you go out to further layers of government, there are different uh, basically operating models and drivers and policies in place that mean that in some cases uh, data won't be made openly available, for example, when they've got drivers to actually make a profit from the data product itself. Um, or they just didn't have clear policy in place and so they basically um, put out contracts and the vendors slipped in clauses and basically gained ownership to that stuff without really people thinking about it. So yeah, make sure that you've got that government policy in place and um, yeah, and it's a long journey. I mean, New Zealand started that journey probably in 2011, but you know, we're ultimately we've still got a lot of challenges and hurdles to overcome. 